All right, let's start with prayer. Father in heaven, thank you for uh, this lesson that we're going to review. We thank you ahead of time because we know and trust that you will bless us through this inspired book. And so we pray for your teaching at this moment, Lord. And um, we thank you so much for the book of Daniel and the life-changing lessons that it gives us. Help us to practice them. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Okay, let's put our phones on silent. I just heard mine. Did you get a portion of your wife's thing? Yeah. Oh, I did. <laughs> Two portions. <laughs> yeah, it was, uh, it's uh, string beans, green beans with uh, soy and, and in a sauce. Oh, it's delicious. Um, good dish, vegan dish, very delicious. Okay, <clears throat> so we're going to go over a quiz. Oh, before that, before that, I um, want to share with you because it is our Daniel challenge, and this is day eight, we want to share with you some of the things that you've uh, heard about, but um, deserves going over, and that is eating and moving, okay? The importance of eating and moving, all right? So you've all heard of New Start, of course, nutrition, exercise, water, sunlight, temperance, air, and rest, and trust in God. Um, those are, you know, the whole world should really know this because these are really the foundational habits to have a wholesome life, not just physically, but mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. Nutrition, of course, um, utilization of food to grow, repair and maintain our bodies if we're eating right. We need the right amount of nutrients. Um, we need to make smart choices. <laughs> um, those are smart choices are the best choices. Uh, we need proper nutrition and a choice to choose good nutrition and a healthy lifestyle. That's nutrition. Here's a, a essential nutrients for life. Our carbohydrates, of course, our proteins. Um, you know that you can get your proteins from these things. You don't need the meats to provide your proteins. And the lipids, uh, our fiber is very important. Our, the American diet does not have enough fiber. That's why a lot of people suffer from constipation. And a lot of people, their bowel movements are not as easy as they should be because of the lack of fiber in the diet. The fiber in the diet are like the brooms for your intestines, for your large intestine. It just sweeps that stuff out. In fact, <laughs> if you were to go home and if you have difficulty of this, and, you're, and if you were to drink a big, tall glass of pure papaya juice. I mean just pure papaya juice or even just eat a papaya. It's going to loosen your bowels. That's what papaya does. In fact, I think milk of magnesia might even have some of these things might have uh, papaya in it and other things, but it's very important. And of course water, the less water we, we drink, the less lubricated we are on the inside. This is one of my challenges. My wife will say, Amen. <laughs> that I don't drink enough water. In fact, I have my water right here. So, do you have your water? I invite you to drink some water. <laughs> um, water um, helps to digest. Not necessarily that you have to drink water with your food, but um, lubricates your body, helps you to think better, helps you to sleep better. I remember my dad, when he was still alive, he wasn't a big water drinker, and neither am I, so this is the area I need to improve in. But if you don't hydrate yourself throughout the day, you may have difficulty at night because your body is dry. And if you're well lubricated, I'm not saying it's the magical answer because obviously there's other things and you may have physiological issues too. But drinking water is that important, and it helps you to lose weight. <laughs> it helps you to lose weight. Okay, so there's some of the essentials, the uh, nuts and vegetables and the grains. Let food be your medicine and medicine your food, right? That's important. 
Okay, what happens to your muscles during exercise? What happens during exercise? What happens to your muscles? They stretch. You need nutrients, your, your blood's going to your muscles. And constant movement, your muscles get toned, don't they? Yes. Um, without that, they atrophy and no movement. Then you get harder and harder to move. It's going to get harder and harder to walk. It's going to get harder to lift something or squat down or something because there's no movement. And that's the problem with uh, people in my profession as pastors. We can't be sitting down and not moving. <laughs> And that was part of this Daniel challenge is to, is to move. I did a little bit of exercise the other day. I hadn't done, I did some squats. And I haven't done them so long. A little sore right here. <laughs> okay. Um, adopting a regular exercise routine is one of the best things that you can do for your long-term health, right? Exercise benefits all tissues in your body, including your heart. What is your heart? It's a pump, right? It's a muscle. Yeah, and it strengthens. Um, bones, ligaments, you know, um, the more you exercise, it is beneficial for those who are prone to diabetes. Um, you need to exercise and move and strengthen those bones. It's very, very important. Good for your intestines, everything, all of your internal organs. It's good for all internal. Exercise is considered a stress to many organ systems because you're stressing it out. When you walk fast and your heart rate goes up to 100, you're stressing your heart out, but it's good. But it differs from the negative stress of everyday life in that it stimulates the breakdown, repair, and growth of muscles, ligaments, tendons, and bones in the process of creating a stronger and more resilient body. So God has given us exercise. What did he tell Adam and Eve to do? To what? To work in the garden. How many of you do gardening? It's one of the best exercises you can do. Last week, I spent hours because after all of this rain, what begins to crop up all over the place? Oh, all these weeds. So last week, oh, those weeds in front of my front yard, and I have gravel. So I have a hula hole, and I'm just, I don't use a Roundup. I haven't used that in years because I personally, I just don't want to use the stuff for their controlling things that they do around the world. Plus, I, eventually I want to put grass and I don't want all that poison in there. But anyways, I was using my hula hoe and oh man, that was a lot of work. And then my poor wife's garden, I mean, there were weeds. We have raised box, boxes, three of them. There's weeds like, I'm embarrassed to say they're about this high. <laughs> I was just, oh, I was just putting it off. All of that rain brought them up. I finally just went there. I just got to do it. I didn't even think about it. I just do it. I ended up spending about three hours out there and it is clean. It's beautiful. Wish I had until next week. I know. Wish I would have taken a picture. It's beautiful. But anyways, you know, you're using everything. It's gardening is good. And then you're with the dirt and soil and nature. Anyways, um, it's good for your tendons, bones, and the process of creating a stronger and more resilient body. During exercise, muscles perform most these two main tasks, they burn available fuel for energy and they contract in response to a rush of electrical signals from the brain, right? So exercise is amazing. Muscle fuel during exercise, it's capable of burning multiple fuels during exercise, including glucose, fatty acids, and amino acids. Move it or lose it. Glucose is stored as glycogen. Glucose is stored within each muscle cell is, how do you, spell, how do you pronounce that? Glycogen, glycogen, um, which is a quick burning fuel used during high intensity exercise. And you know, also the, the oh, what does they call it? Dopamine, is that what it's called? The, yeah, that's released. Yeah, it makes you feel good and ah, it just feels great. Fatty acids are stored within muscle cells as triglycerides. They provide a secondary fuel source for low intensity exercise like walking, jumping, and yard. Some people have more higher triglycerides than others. Sometimes it's hereditary. Okay, so that's why I said move it or lose it. So everybody stand up. Everybody stand up. Okay. All right. And I want you to reach up as high as you can. Put your arms down. Now do this 10 times. Ready, set, go. One, two, three. 
four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Okay, now we're going to go walk around the block a couple of, no, I'm just kidding. Okay, so you just move it, just move, and actually you can do some like this for your mid-waist if you can, yeah? It's very important, especially after the meal because I know already what's going to happen in about 15 minutes. I already know. I can see your faces 15 minutes from now. Your faces are going to look like this because of the delicious food we just ate. <laughs> so, yeah, look at, look at Mary. She's even lifting her legs. You can lift your legs. <laughs> I did this the other day. I was just doing this. I don't know how many did, like 50 of them or something. The next day, oh my goodness, I don't use those muscles enough because I got sore. And yeah, look at Harold. Look at that. He's just, he's just staying there. That's pretty good. <laughs> no, he's not. His... All right, great. So you can sit down. Importance of exercise. And uh, that was part of our Daniel challenge, which ends in two days to get moving. Okay, you should have a quiz card in your hands. So let's go over the quiz for the lesson for this morning. Number one, the only chapter in the book of Daniel not written by Daniel is chapter four. It was written by Nebuchadnezzar. Okay, we'll go over that again. But is that true or false? Number two. God allowed Nebu to go insane because he wanted to make fun of him. Is that true or false? Okay. Number three, as a result of his insanity, Nebuchadnezzar was humbled. When he recovered, he acknowledged the God of heaven as the true God. Question number four, God saves people by grace plus works that they are able to do. Sounds kind of tricky, that one. God saves people by grace plus works that they are able to do. Is that true or false? Number five, the word believe means to have implicit trust in Christ to put our full weight on him. Okay? All right. The only chapter, going back to number one, in Daniel, not written by him, is from Nebuchadnezzar. Is that true or false? That's true. I almost said false. It's true because of the first person narrative that's in that book. I, Nebuchadnezzar. Maybe, I don't, as a king, you don't write yourself. <laughs> right? I'm sure he dictated to, you know, Halukama or somebody, you know, high secretary, but, but he wrote it, he wrote it. Number two, God, just like, just like, um, who wrote the book of Romans, by the way? No, you're wrong. <laughs> I'll show you. Go to Romans chapter 16. Ah, oh, you're wrong. You're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. I'm sorry. No, no. You're wrong. No. Well, yeah. <laughs> Romans 16. And uh, this is a bonus point. Look at, okay. Chapter 16, and let's see, look at verse 22. So tell me who wrote the book of Romans. Verse 22. Tertius? Tertius wrote it. <laughs> That's what it says. I, Tertius, who wrote this letter, greet you in the Lord. Now you're all like, oh, this is new theology. <laughs> Apparently it was Paul's companion, but... It's Paul's letter, but apparently he dictated it or something. This is the reason why, and I didn't, mean, it didn't, I didn't even mean to get into this. We don't know what the thorn in Paul's side was, that he pleads with the Lord, take it away from me. But because he was blind for three days when he was converted, and because of this statement in 16 verse 22, some scholars, it's guesswork, but some, it's an educated guess, say that, the thorn in Paul's side was bad eyesight. Maybe he was like me. You know, in this eye, I have like 2250 in one eye, and the other eye is like 2200. Yeah, isn't that right, Elisa? Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it's less. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so some scholars say, uh, because of what this says too, Paul couldn't write himself. And in fact, in another letter, he ends it by, maybe it's Galatians, he says, see with what big letters I write. He actually says that. So that's why it combined, some say, but, but I, it's just sort of, I'm just trying to fool you. 
Um, Tertius, it was dictated to him, but it's Paul's letter, okay? So don't go saying, pastor doesn't believe Paul wrote the letter. Uh, God allowed Nebuchadnezzar to go insane because he wanted to make fun of him. Hear, hear! No, of course, that's false. That's false. As a result of his insanity, he was humbled, he recovered and acknowledged the God of heaven as the true God. Well, we saw that this morning from the book. Uh, that is definitely true. Number four, God saves people by grace plus works that they are able to do. What do you say? That's false. God saves people by grace alone through faith. The works are a fruit. The works are a fruit of that salvation. Um, now, this is, uh, this is where it actually becomes dangerous, but it's so subtle. When years ago, that infamous meeting with Kenneth Copeland and Bishop Tony, who died in a motorcycle accident some years ago, and the Pope on the camera, and Kenneth Copeland had it. Did you ever see that? And Bishop Tony had literally said, the Protestant Reformation is over. And so do some of these evangelical Christians. Because Bishop Tony was talking about the Catholic understanding of salvation. And the Christians in the audience say, hey, now we're one. But if you read closely the Vatican documents from Vatican II in the 1960s and their catechism, this is still their view. It's not the Bible's view. So I don't think there's any Catholics present, but this... Um, anyways, number five, the word believe means to have implicit trust in Jesus and to put our full weight on him, yea or nay. That is true, of course, that's a yes. Okay, let's open our Bibles. Let's gonna, we're going to look at some uh, facts here. Revelation warns that what happened 2,500 years ago in ancient Babylon will be repeated in the last days. These historical stories are prophetic. And again, just a very 30-second review nugget. When King Nebuchadnezzar um, decreed in chapter 4, now I commend everybody to worship this God of Daniel. His heart is in the right place, but from our American, modern American perspective, his constitutional mind was in the wrong place because God never tells any government, I want you people to force everybody to believe in me, except when it's a theocratic government in the Old Testament, but there was a joint agreement between the Israelites and God. They said, God, we will do everything you say. On Mount Sinai, they said this. We'll obey and we'll do everything you say. So they established a covenant. That's a theocracy. But when God gave them permission to get a king, and we saw this in Final Empire, God said, but here's the rules I'm setting down for the king you're going to choose. He's not, he's not going to be above the law. He's going to meditate on me, follow me, that type of thing. But in our democratic society, or democratic form of government, we will see this repeated where, quote unquote, Babylon will enforce worship of God. The only thing is, what kind of God is that? That's a Babylonian uh, way to do things. That's why our country is so great. It's got it's a lot, it's very imperfect, but it's, it's great. All right, so... The last night of Babylon. Okay, how many of you have ever heard of Herodotus? Herodotus, he was a, he was a historian. He, um, boy, when did he write this? I think it was probably in the, I want to say in the 300s BC, 400s BC, um, Herodotus. But um, he writes about the Persian Wars which includes Babylon, of course. And um, I think you guys find this interesting. So listen, listen to this. You're going to have to indulge me for a little bit, okay? So please. 
This is what Herodotus says. In the course of his advance on Babylon, Cyrus came to the Gins, a river which rises in Matin and flows through the land of the Dardanians before it joins with another river, the Tigris, which in turn flows past the city of Opus, which is in modern Baghdad today, and onto the Red Sea. Because the Gins was too deep to be fordable, it was Cyrus's plan to attempt the crossing using boats. But one of his sacred white horses, wild with overconfidence, plunged into the river with the intention of swimming to the opposite bank. Swept underwater, the horse found the currents too strong for it, and it was borne away. Well, this incensed Cyrus. <laughs> his response to this show of brutal arrogance from the river was one of fury. So much so indeed that he swore so to enfeeble the Gins, this river, that in future even a woman would be able to cross it easily and emerge with her knees perfectly dry. So he lost one of his best horses. And in fact, I think Sean Boonstra alluded to this in The Final Empire. Sure enough, he followed up this threat by abandoning his expedition against the Babylonians. So this is Cyrus the king, the Persian. He's so mad at this river, he puts a pause on his attack towards the Babylonians. Dividing his army in two and then marking out on both banks of the Gins 180 trenches. So this is the river, 180 trenches on this side, 180 trenches on that side. All of them drawn perfectly straight and radiating out in every direction. After this, with his men primed for action, Cyrus gave them the order to get digging. The job was duly completed, as was hardly surprising considering the size of the workforce, but not before the whole summer had been used up. So these guys were at this for months, digging these, uh, what, 362 canals. <laughs> because he was mad because this arrogant river took his horse away. <laughs> the following spring, the Bible says that the springtime when kings go out for battle, you ever read that verse? Because the weather's nice, it's perfect. Hey, let's go out for a war. <laughs> the following spring, however, once Cyrus had been avenged upon the Gins and left the river sliced up into 360 channels, he resumed his drive against Babylon. The Babylonians were waiting for him in a position in advance of their city. So the whole army was just outside of their city. At Cyrus's approach, they, meaning the Babylonians, moved to the attack, but lost the resulting engagement and were forced to retreat behind their walls. Isn't this fascinating? Of course, it hardly came as any great revelation to them that Cyrus was a man of restless, and restless ambition, for they had long been tracking the indiscriminate course of his aggression against other peoples far and wide. And so they had taken the precaution of stockpiling food sufficient to last them for many years. As a result, they viewed the prospect of a siege with equanimity. And indeed, as time dragged by and everything continued as a stalemate, it was Cyrus who found his position an increasingly precarious one. They have all the food they need. They got the water, the Euphrates. So Cyrus is thinking, ah, what now? What do I do now? I've got to think of my army. In the event, however, either on the suggestion of some advisor or perhaps on his own initiative, I think on his own initiative, remembering what he did to the Gins River when he lost his horse, he arrived at a solution to his predicament. His entire army was commanded to take up battle stations with one contingent drawn up at the point where the Euphrates flows at full pelt into Babylon and the other, the other army on the opposite side of the city, where the river exits, where it exits, both of them with orders to wait until they could see that the river had become traversable and then to advance along its course into the city. This is interesting. Meanwhile, as his troops moved to follow these instructions and take up their positions, Cyrus himself rode off at the head of all his non-combatant units. In other words, the ones with the shovels and the picks. His target was the very lake which had been the scene of the Babylonian queen's hydraulic operations 
which he had redrawn the course of the Euphrates as well as the, of the lake itself. And just as Nitocris has done, so now Cyrus did also. Uh, something previous that had happened and now there was this lake and now it's just a dry lake bed. So he remembers this. The river was channeled along a trench into the marsh that the lake had become so that the, flo the waters flowing along its original course began to subside and ended up fordable. This, of course, was precisely what the Persians stationed on the banks of the Euphrates had been instructed to wait for. And, so so and no sooner had the river level subsided to the height of a man's thigh, if that, then they were making their entrance into Babylon. Now, the historian says this, if the Babylonian, Babylonians had only been given forewarning of what Cyrus was up to, or fathomed it for themselves, then they could have turned the entrance of the Persians into their city so completely to their own advantage as to have annihilated the invaders, the invaders utterly. All they would have had to do was to secure the postern gates that opened out into the river and mount the low walls that run along its banks, and they would have had the Persians caught as if in a trap. As it was, however, this is where the Bible comes in. As it was, however, the, en the enemy was upon them before they knew what had hit them. Indeed, according to local tradition, such was the size of the city that those who lived in the center of Babylon had no idea that the suburbs had fallen. For it was a time of festival, and all were dancing and indulging themselves in pleasures, so that when they did finally get the news, it was very much the hard way. And that is the story of how, for the first time, Babylon fell. <laughs> now, you always hear in seminars like this, they went under the gate. Well, I just read to you from the historian himself how it, how it happened. Judah? Well, if they were, Cyrus's army got them or took them prisoner or, or, or something. But, uh, you know, when you live in a city like that, like, for example, um, for example, let's, let's take Russia. Let's take Russia. Um, you think they're going to be afraid of a, a tiny little country, the Czech Republic, of invading them and defeating them? Are you kidding? They're secure. You know, they were secure. Okay, number one. List five things that Belshazzar did that defied the God of heaven. Okay, now I hope you were able to read chapter five of Daniel because I'm not going to do what I did this morning. List five things, okay? Letter A, Belshazzar made a great feast in defiance of the God of heaven. So it was party hardy time, right? Letter B, he drank wine before the thousand. Okay, so there was a lot of drinking, lots of booze, lots of drunkenness. Um, letter C, he commanded to bring the golden and silver vessels out of the temple, which was in Jerusalem. Well, he didn't go back to Jerusalem. That means the temples that Nebuchadnezzar brought from Jerusalem, right? Letter D, the king and his princes, his wives and his concubines drank in them. Well, of course. I mean, it's like the most beautiful goblets, exquisite. And it makes you feel special when you're drinking from these beautiful goblets from the president's own Oval Office, <laughs> you know, or something. You know, I mean, it's impressive, all of these cool stuff. You know, they were just living it up that night. Letter E, they praised the gods of gold and of silver, of brass, of iron, of wood, and of stone. Okay? Anybody but a god of heaven. This was just a, this was a royal bash, you know, like a $5,000 a plate dinner. <laughs> this was just, this was a major, major feast and party. Okay, so question number two, in the midst of their blasphemy against God, what suddenly appeared and startled the entire assembly. 
That's right. God playing Babylonian tic-tac-toe with them. Yeah. You know, and God wins the tic-tac-toe. <laughs> Fingers of a man's hand writing on the wall. That would freak anybody out. Whoa. You just see the back of a hand. The letters of fire. <laughs> it's actually kind of comical how the king reacted to that. Um, in fact, let's read that. I, I don't know if it's going to be in here, but let's go to Daniel 5. And <laughs> it's, oh man, it's, it's kind of funny when you think about it. Okay, Daniel 5. And let's go to verse 6. Daniel 5 and verse 6. No, verse 6. So, 6. Oh, dear. Listen, you're not listening. I said, let's see how the king reacts. Verse 6. Then the king's face grew, what? Pale, and his thoughts alarmed him. And his hip joints went slack, and his knees began knocking together. You ever seen those cartoons? Their teeth are chattering. And they're... <laughs> That's what King Nebuchadnezzar's reaction. He was, you know, in a worldly in a worldly way, he was doing other things too, <laughs> you know, um, and shaking in his boots, shaking in his boots. Okay, who did the king call to? So he was just, he was f fainting. Who did the king call to interpret the writing? What do you got to say? Not yet, Bianca. Not yet. Not yet. The wise men of Babylon. So this is what the verse says. The king, verse 7, called aloud to bring in the conjurers, the Chaldeans, and the diviners, etc. And you guys, help! Help me! He is just scared. This, this guy is really scared. Okay, were the wise men able to interpret the writing? No, they weren't. It was French to them. Right? The Bible says, no, they could not interpret it. It's all French to me. Okay? <laughs> okay, so here again, it's repeating itself. God is discrediting these guys. And more and more, these guys are just losing their credibility in the king's eyes, don't you think? Just, it's again, here we go again. Um, well, actually, Nebuchadnezzar's gone. I was thinking Nebuchadnezzar. This is uh, Belshazzar. But he's discrediting them in the eyes of this new king, this, this second ruler of Babylon. Okay, so um, listen to this. Corby Bernson, the character he plays are L.A. Law, divorce lawyer Arnold Becker, has little in his mind other than winning cases and making lots and lots of money. But he has play on his mind to judge from an interview again in the Washington Post. This is years ago. We should legalize drugs and spend the money we now put into combating them into education. That's still something that's, uh, in fact, some nations do this. We should amend the Constitution to have a president for foreign affairs and a president for domestic affairs. What do you think about that? And we should realize that religion has become an outdated answer to some of our problems. That's what he's recommending. The belief in an afterlife, he says, makes people disclaim responsibility for this life. Oh, really? You know, we should be, you're so heavenly minded, you're the best earthly good. Because if we really are really heavenly minded, we'll be the best earthly citizens. People treat this earth like a motel room because they think they're going to some other place. As far as I know, when I die, I'm not going anywhere else, so don't mess up my heaven. The sooner people realize we come from apes and that's the way it happened, the sooner we get a reality check on ourselves. Ooh, ooh, ooh. You have to follow your heart and your heart is not guided by anything except what's, what is in us as thinking animals. If it means dismantling religion, we might have to do that. Well, I would say Corbin Bernson has been discredited because God goes on and on and on. The Bible goes on and on and on. No matter what people say, faith goes on. Christianity is not going to die. <clears throat> yeah. <laughs> okay. So Daniel interprets the writing. Question number five. Who suggests to the king that he call in Daniel? Who suggests? Bianca. Huh? 
the queen, the queen mother, his wife. So we need to listen to our wives, right, guys? <laughs> listen, to, listen to the wife. <laughs> She's giving some wise counsel. Okay, so it's uh, the queen that ends up giving him this advice, and she actually says, "Let's read it in the Bible. Let's read what it says." Uh, oops, where am I? This way. So look at verse ten. It says, the queen entered the banquet hall because of the words of the king. She heard that he was, his knees were knocking. And she said, O king, live forever. Do not let your thoughts alarm you or your face be pale. There is a man in your kingdom in whom, whom is a spirit of the holy gods. And in the days of your father, illumination, insight, and wisdom, like the wisdom of the gods were found in him. And King Nebuchadnezzar, your father, your father the king, Appointed him chief of the magicians, conjurers, Chaldeans, and diviners. And I'm thinking, well, doesn't he know about Daniel? <laughs> but uh, anyway, so that's what she suggests, and it's good advice. What position did Belshazzar offer to Daniel, or any of these other sorcerers, uh, by reading that writing on the wall? Third place in the kingdom. Yep, third place in the kingdom. Let's read it. Thou shalt be the third third ruler of the kingdom. I don't, I hope I don't forget, so remind me, but this is, this is actually a significant statement by Belshazzar when he says third ruler of the kingdom. Okay, number seven, before interpreting the writing, Daniel reminds Belshazzar of Nebuchadnezzar's insanity because he failed to recognize and honor the God of heaven. Did Belshazzar already know this? What do you say? Yeah. He did know it. Daniel says, and you knew this. And you knew this. Um, well, let's, let's just look at here. Though thou knewest all this, he says. And he just recounts the history of King Nebuchadnezzar and what happened in Daniel chapter 4. <laughs> right? What had Belshazzar done? By the way, it's, sometimes it's confusing, isn't it? Because what's Daniel's new name? Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar, Belteshazzar. This is King Belshazzar. Even sometimes I get them mixed up. I'll say, was it King Belteshazzar or Bel <laughs> um, What did this king do that invoked the wrath of God according to Daniel 5 verse 23? What did he do? Thou hast lifted up thyself against the Lord of heaven and brought the vessels of his house and drunk wine in them. So, you know, this is, this is interesting because what's the big deal of using gold and silver goblets and vessels? What's the big deal about that? Well, yes. What's the big deal? Holy things okay. In the okay. And this All right. Okay. Good. Yep. There's nothing special in gold itself, obviously. In the material, materialistically, gold is gold, silver is silver. But like you said, when God came and sanctified the sanctuary that Solomon had built, I mean, there was smoke. They couldn't continue their dedicatory services. God had blessed and anointed the place with his own presence, as well as all of the vessels. And so only the priests could use those vessels. You know, Joe Smith couldn't use them because they were set apart for a special use. So when Belshazzar comes along, Daniel reminds him, your king knew all of this. And he ended up respecting God and those things that belong to God. Belshazzar couldn't care less. He just wanted to show off these beautiful things, right? And so I think in a way, to me, I'm thinking, you know, goblets are goblets. Some are nicer than the others. Some are made of gold and silver. Others are made of wood. Goblets are goblets. But it's sort of the principle and the thing behind it. These are for special use. So if I come up here to the pulpit and I'm preparing something for our banquet next Saturday night and I need a table to saw something and have, oh, I'll use this. And I bring a piece of wood and I start sawing things and I start drilling. I wouldn't do that because this has a special meaning to it, wouldn't you say? I wouldn't say if it falls down accidentally, we're all going to be struck by lightning. But there's, there's just something to be said 
about the building and the things of God are special. They're set apart for holy uses. Wouldn't you say so? So this morning I said, I'm interjecting some moral principles here. So now I'm going to step on your toes. Would you let me step on your toes and mine? What about our bodies? I'm making more room for the Holy Spirit. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't hear that one. <laughs> what about our bodies? Here we are so readily to defend God and fight for him because they're using these holy vessels that they shouldn't be using. And shame on Belshazzar. And, you know, we should slap him in the face. And you got yours coming. But God would say something like, your bodies are the temple of the Holy Spirit. What about us? This. Aren't we set apart for holy use? I have to remind myself about this every day. I do. Every day I have to remind myself about it. Because God says God will destroy those who destroy, uh, destroy uh, what, what does he say? His temple. He'll destroy those who destroy his temple. God is going to bring us to account in some things that we didn't even think of. And then it's going to be too late. Oh my goodness, I didn't think about it that way. God, but you're right. I'm sorry. We need to... Uh, be spiritually minded. Okay? I have no idea why I have an Obama dollar bill on there. <laughs> what were we talking about? Uh, who knows? <laughs> Number nine, it was an illustration. Number nine, give the meaning of the words written on the wall. Can somebody tell, give me the meaning? Or is it French to you? <laughs> okay, so here it is. Here we go. Mene. Oh, by the way, let me go back to question. Um, I, I'm ahead of myself on my slides as opposed to my lesson. Let's go back to this third ruler. Remember I had said earlier this third ruler thing? Um, I have a little note here. A Babylonian text... The verse account, capital V, capital A, of Nabonidus, capital N. So that's what it's officially called, the verse account of Nabonidus. This is something that archaeologists have, have found. A Babylonian text, the verse account of Nabonidus, relates that Nabonidus placed the military troops under Belshazzar's command and entrusted the kingship, kingship to him before departing to the west. During the approximate 10-year reign of Belshazzar, Nabonidus remained on campaign in Tema, which is Arabia. Nabonidus, this is all in that text. Nabonidus also was apparently devoted to the god Sin, S-I-N. Uh, no relation to Sin, Sin in the Bible's definition, but it was a god. Um, he had no interest in the worship of Marduk, which was the chief Babylonian god and even ceased to observe the traditional New Year festival. He was thus despised as a heretical and negligent monarch. This is Nabonidus. Curiously, Nabonidus seems to have been one of history's first archaeologists, having carried out excavations at, in Uruk and Ur. Though always referred to as son of the king in Assyrian sources, Belshazzar exercised all the functions of kingship, including receiving tribute, granting leases, and attending to the upkeep of the temples as attested in several business letters and contracts con uh, contemporary to his reign. All of this stuff is proven by extra biblical sources, outside of the source outside of the Bible. He was apparently as impious as his father, seen in his lack of regard for the God of Israel, and ruthless as well. As second ruler, he promised Daniel the position of third ruler. So Nabonidus was the king, Belshazzar was a regent, while the real king was in Arabia for about 10 years. So that's why he says, I'm going to make you third ruler, because he knew he was number two. He was the number two guy. Isn't that interesting? A lot of this stuff. By the way, back in the 1700s, uh, 1800s, all of this wasn't known. This stuff hadn't been discovered. Also, Darius the Mede is another issue. That was another issue in Daniel. Who's this Darius the Mede guy? 
You know, I thought it was Cyrus. All of that stuff has been answered through archaeological discoveries, backing up what the Bible says. Because before, they would say, whoever wrote Daniel did not know history, committed historical blunders. This is not true. Until, until the sands spoke forth their voice. <laughs> All right, so uh, many, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. Letter B, Tekel, thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Okay, in the balances. Of course, this is all language they can understand. You know, balances, you're found wanting. Something's heavier than you are, so you're found wanting in weight. You're in trouble. And then letter C, Paris, thy kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and Persians. There's an artist's rendition of Babylon. Here's the Euphrates River. And of course, I read to you what Herodotus says about that. Okay, letter number 10, letter A. How soon was the prophecy fulfilled? It was right away <laughs> that night. And there's another picture how they just diverted the river and walk right under. Um, I think, I can't remember, but I think Babylon, they say, was like 10 square miles, the city itself. Uh, that's a significant size in those days, especially when you have to surround it by big, thick walls. Who knows how long that took to build those walls? That's a big city. So much so that he says the people in the middle didn't realize that the Perimeter, perimeter of the city was already overtaken by the Babel, by the Persians. They didn't even realize it because they were so drunk and party hardy that night. Letter B, who became the new ruler of Babylon? Who? Darius the Median. Darius the Median. And this is another significant statement. The Mede. It doesn't just say Darius the king. It doesn't say Darius king over Babylon. It says Darius the Mede. And look at your note. Um, let's see. Oh, I already went through that. Never mind. And do I have a note on Darius the Mede? I thought I did here. I think it's here. Oh, I think I didn't bring up my note. Um, okay, we'll go to 11. How does the book of Revelation describe the fall of modern spiritual Babylon at the time of the end. So now we're connecting what happened in ancient civilization to the future. According to Revelation 16 verses 12 through 16. The river Euphrates is dried up in preparation for the kings from the east is what it says in, in Revelation. So Euphrates is dried up. He uses the terminology and the imagery back when Babylon was conquered. The, isn't this interesting? how it's like God trying to send a message. Yeah, the last day spiritual Babylon is also going to fall. Read Revelation 18, by the way, on that one. Um, it prepares a way for the kings of the east. Just said that. Number 12, what happens when the kings of the east come to, to deliver? What happens when the kings of the east come to deliver God's people? Verses 18 and 19, Revelation. Great Babylon came in remembrance before God. God came in remembrance before God. Okay, so let's talk about characteristics of modern Babylon. We're going to be number 13. It says here in your lesson, Revelation makes it very clear that there will be another Babylon at the time of the end. The Babylon spoken of in Revelation is not the same as the Babylon of Daniel's day. When Cyrus and Darius conquered Babylon, it became a heap of ruins and has remained so to the present day. Of course, remember Saddam Hussein wanted to rebuild it. The Bible foretells the rise of another Babylon, which will do the same to God's people as did ancient Babylon. Okay? So, look at this fact. Same events that caused the fall of ancient literal Babylon will cause the fall of modern spiritual Babylon at the time of the end. And this is what the Bible calls... Uh, Babylon, the great what? Whore or prostitute that sitteth upon many waters. Okay? And what's written on her forehead, by the way? Do you remember what's written on her forehead? 
Mystery Babylon the Great, Mother of Harlots. Well, if it's a mother, she has daughters. Otherwise, why would it say mother? Right? So this woman and what she symbolizes has lots of little children, other women, and a corrupt woman in the Bible, nothing against women, but a corrupt woman, and there's corrupt men too, obviously, but a corrupt woman in the Bible is, is indicative of a corrupt people, corrupt person, corrupt woman. So this mother of whores has other little whores roaming around earth, okay? Children. What do the waters that the whore sits on represent? Revelation 17, 15. Yep, waters uh, are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues. What, is, what do tongues mean? Languages. Yeah, languages, uh, dialects, yeah, etc. In fact, if you read Acts uh, chapter 2, this is in chapter 2, dialects. Yes, in chapter 2, when uh, the apostles are talking other languages, unknown to them, but known to the hearers. And the hearers say, what is this? We hear, the, we hear them speaking in our own language. Medes, Parthenians, and all these people. Well, if you look at the Greek word, that word for, we hear them speak in our own language, is dialecto. Where do you think our English word is that comes from that Greek word? Dialect. And they, they say, we hear them speaking in our own dialects, which is interesting because it gives you a list, I think it's about 9 or 12 uh, nations that are represented on the day of Pentecost. There's all different dialects. They're all Jews. Otherwise, why would they be in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost celebrating the feast? So they're all Jews. But they're all, be, they're all able to speak those different dialects. Anyways, I went off on that one. <laughs> but anyways, waters are peoples and multitudes and nations and tongues, right? So what is the great sin of Babylon? According to Revelation 17, verse 2. Well, your lesson says, With whom the kings of the earth have committed what? Fornication. And the inhabitants of the earth have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So again, this corrupt woman um, is, uh, is, is uh, committing acts of fornication with whom? According to this verse, with whom? In heaven. Well, right here. With whom? The kings of the earth. With whom the kings of the earth committed? Who are the kings of the earth? The statesmen, the leaders, the presidents, prime ministers, kings, queens, etc. And so what's interesting about this end time Babylon picture is that national leaders are in cahoots with this corrupt, with this corruption. It's interesting how it mentions the kings of the earth and the inhabitants and says, and have committed fornication and the inhabitants of the earth have, made, uh, have been made drunk with the wine of her fornication. So you have, I know, the way I see that, um, I'm not going to be dogmatic about this, but it's almost like a top-down type of thing. Or it could be a grassroots type of thing. I mean, either one, you know. Either one, I don't care. But the, the main point is that everybody, it's not, just, it's not just the common people, it's the leaders of our world, our president, prime ministers. They're involved with this last day um, Babylon, whorish uh, corruption, false religion. So here's Satan's technique, mixing a little error with truth, mostly truth. That's his technique making error appear spiritual and religious. Well, of course, otherwise it wouldn't be so deceptive. It sounds good. In fact, this isn't nothing new. Even Jesus said this in his day where he said, take heed because the days are coming when people who kill you will think they're doing God a service. 
So how many people, St. Bartholomew's Massacre, how many people have been massacred in the name of, we're just doing God a service? You know? The Crusades, Crusades is another one on both sides, on both sides. The what? Yeah, sectarians, Dutch Germans, even Protestant Christians in the early years of our nation. You know, Salem witch, hunt, uh, witch hunt, hunts. Um, the clergy, even though they came in the Constitution and they were still learning how to be a new country, the clergy still had a lot of power that they were able to wield and influence and voice. And so, it, you know, it came slowly, these religious liberties that we enjoy. But, you know, it could make, it could sound good. It could sound good. Um, blessing you while living in sin, while living in sin. Nobody likes to be told what they're doing wrong, but that's what the Bible tells us. And it behooves us to take heed. Number 16, what does God call this harlot who defies God by mixing paganism and Christianity? Babylon the Great. And of course, that's what's on her forehead. Look at the note in your lessons below number 16. In Revelation, God is warning us against an apostate system of religion that mixes paganism with Christianity and yet claims to worship God. We must be vividly aware that both Daniel and Revelation are warning us against a false religious system in the last days that will attempt to force people to worship God falsely by mixing paganism and Christianity, just as ancient Babylon defied God by mixing elements of the worship of God with the worship of pagan deities. How important it is that we be as faithful as Daniel so that we are not corrupted by modern Babylon. Um, someday, you know, I'd like to go to Italy and visit the Vatican and all of these places where there's cathedrals and, you know, and churches, etc. But uh, people who've seen all of that stuff say that you'll easily see statues that used to be dedicated to pagan gods, and now they were just converted to St. Peter, you know, or, or, or something. Um, and this isn't, by the way, this isn't a, an Adventist Ellen White thing. You read history books, like I just did a couple of weeks ago, and just history books, non-sectarian history books, they'll tell you that pagan Rome was metamorphosed into religious Rome. They all say the same thing. They all say the same thing. Um, you know, uh, uh, the, the pontiff, that is a Roman Latin word. Maximus Pontus is what I wanted to say. Maximus Pontus, that was a word used for Caesar. And of course it was transferred to uh, the bishop of Rome, the Pope. Okay, let's go to the next one, number 17. What message does God proclaim about modern Babylon? Revelation 18. This is what God says. Babylon the Great is fallen, is fallen, and is become the habitation of devils. Now all of this stuff is, it's going to, in the in last days, it, it's very subtle. You're not going to see red fire and evil devils appearing out of nowhere. You know, it's, it's all very subtle. It sounds very convincing. Mostly, uh, mostly truth, part error. Enough error to be fatal if you follow. And of course, when it comes to obeying God 100%, then they may change the times and the laws. Right? As Daniel 7 says. Number 18, how widespread will be the influence of mighty modern spiritual Babylon in the last days? Well, it's said there in Revelation 18, all nations have drunk of the wine of the wrath of her fornication. All nations. That's everyone. And this is, uh, again, it's a very uh, potent, pervasive power that we really need to be on our spiritual toes because Jesus himself said this. He said, if it were possible, even the very elect will be deceived. Even the very elect. Well, if, if you consider yourself the very elect, I like to consider myself the very elect, 
I'm not perfect, but we all like to consider ourselves very elect. We better be on our toes because it is going to be that deceptive combined with Revelation 16, what it says, the spirits of demons going out to perform miracles, you know, to get ready for the great day of God, the battle of Armageddon. Um, it's, it's going to be tricky. It's going to be tricky. And unless we're well fortified with Scripture and we have a strong relationship with Jesus now, as we've been repeating in this whole series, you know, if you pass the test now and are faithful now, you'll make it in the future crisis. Um, it's very, very important. Very, very important. Um, history will be repeated. God's own people were not ready when Jesus came the first time. That's why he had to bypass them and go to men from the east and go to shepherds who were the lowlifes. Um, before Jesus' second coming, well, God's, it's going to repeat itself. History will repeat itself. God's going to have to look in other places. There will be the faithful still, but the remnant is going to just come together and from places that may shock us. Whoa, you believe? <laughs> right? Number 19, we're wrapping up here. What loving message does God send to his people who are in Babylon? What does he say? Come out. Come out. He says, come out of her what? My people. So, in any religious, political, global organizations that have a mixture of religious beliefs and there's paganism in there, um, and there may even be well, Wiccan teachings in there, very New Age stuff. Um, does, people, does God have people in those places? The Bible says yes. I'll never forget, my wife and I went out passing literature uh, a few years back here in Tempe. And we drove a little bit down that way, and we had these little glow tracks. And so we're just, we parked the car and we're walking. We're walking this way, and across the street we see this lady, and she's watering her plants in the front yard. She's probably in her 50s. And uh, so we say, well, let's go over there. Let's go give her one of these tracks. So we go over there, and we introduce ourselves. Hi, we're just going around and passing out this, these free little pamphlets for you. We'd like you to have one. She's, she's, she's watering then she looks at it, and I don't remember what the glow track said, but she says something to the fact, oh, she's, oh, that's okay, I'm, I'm good. That's what she said. In fact, um, they don't live here anymore because the house is, no, that's the next house, but this house has new people, but some years ago I went here, I did the same thing, and the lady that used to live there said, no, I'm good, I'm good. But anyway, so this is what the lady said. You remember this lady who was watering her cactus plants, and, and then... Uh, we said something to the effect that uh, we kind of pushed it a little bit. I don't want to just let her off that easy. So I said, no, this is, this is about God or whatever we said. I don't remember. And she says, well, she says, I believe in a universal spirit. Do you remember that? And she began to use terms of, of you know, like New Age-ish terms. Um, this very esoteric, mystical... Uh, interpretation of the divine that a lot of people hold to today. People don't like organized religion anymore and denominations, but they'll, they're all cool about spirituality. They're fine with spirituality, but not with the organized stuff. So anyway, she began to use those terms. And, and uh, so me, I've heard those terms before and I've, I already know how to respond to those situations. So I use the same terminology she did. And I said, oh, I said something like, yeah, we believe in the same thing. I said, I believe in a universal spirit. <laughs> Don't we? <laughs> I, I used her same words. I said, oh, yeah, I believe in a universal spirit. She used energy, I think. I said, yeah, I believe in that. I believe that everyone in the world has this universal energy. Now, in my thinking, I'm thinking everybody has eternity in their hearts, like, like Ecclesiastes says. God has put eternity in the heart of man. But I'm using her ter terminology. Um, and then we began, I think, talking about prayer or, or something. I, I think it was prayer. And, but I wanted her to have that pamphlet. So I wasn't, I wasn't giving her a new theology and denying my own beliefs in the name of 
trying to have this woman accept what I, wa I wanted her to have, but I compromised my typical Adventist terms to match hers without denying my theology. And you may confront people like that where you're not used to the way they explain things, but they're basically, in some cases, no, can be referring to God. Another experience I had, I was in Australia, and, uh, and I said something in this seminar, I don't remember what it was, and this guy comes to me, not Adventist Christian at all, he comes to me, he says, hey, he says, I really like what you said there. I said, oh yeah, he says, yeah, you know, I also have this connection with this divine spirit and started talking again in this New Ages terms. I said, really? I said, well, so do I. And he says, you do? I said, yeah, I, I do the exact same thing. I said, every day I try and connect with this divine energy and his spirit speaks with my spirit because that's what Paul says. That's what the apostle Paul says. He uses exactly those terms, except people, they like to use terms like that spirit, energy, spark, uh, divine within. I don't believe in the divine within in the sense that we're like God, but Right. Right. Yeah, because when we talk about the Ten Commandments and obedience, that's not so sophisticated, Soundy. It's biblical, but it's not sophisticated. One of the things that when I, especially when I talk to the Navajos, I refer to God as my creator. Right, right. And I'm using, I mean, I don't, I know they believe in different things. Right. Yeah. Yes. And that's kind of, I'm not offending anybody because that's a big thing across the street. You have to be careful yeah. uh, of how you speak to the students or right. because of that reason. Right. They're so politically correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That you can really be God. Yeah. Like you have that. to be careful. You have to be careful. Yeah. Yeah, that's good with Native Americans using that word creator. My creator. I yes, my creator. Yeah. So I was talking with this guy in Australia, and I was saying, yeah. He says, you do. I said, yeah. I said, every day, I call it my devotional time. I said, for me, I call it my devotional time. But I pray to this divine power every day. And we connect, and there's a connection between there and up here. <laughs> I was doing this. <laughs> you know? Which is true, right? It's true. That happens. That's what we do. But I was accommodating my language. And he was just like on fire. <laughs> he was like, wow, really? That's cool. And you know what he told me? He says, we got to talk about this more tomorrow. <laughs> I said, all right. <laughs> and then the next day came, and I never saw him. But I'm here talking with another Adventist pastor that was there. And I, and I, and I, I feel this. And I look around. He says, hey, how's it going? <laughs> I said, how are you doing? He passed by. To me, that was worth it all because, as Ellen White says, agree with the people as much as far reaching as your conscience allows to do. But sometimes we have to may couch it in language that we're not used to because it's the language they use. And Paul says to the Jew, with the law, I became like a Jew with the law, although I'm without the law, except I have the law of Christ, is what he says. With those without the law, I became as one having without the law. Or, you know, he talks in that language. So that by some means, by some way, I might save some. I become all things to all men. Uh, he's not denying his own self-identity, but he's willing to accommodate and adjust his explanations uh, and, and how he explains those things because he wants to save people. Now, why did I go into all, oh, because of this statement, come out of my people. God has a lot of people out there that we in our religious arrogance may believe there's no way because they're not Seventh-day Adventists. Not true. Not according to this statement. So just realize there's a lot of people that belong to God. And he says, they're in the wrong place, but they're right in here. They may be wrong in certain doctrines. In fact, you know what? Ooh, I'm really on my hobby horse here, but 
Let me read this to you. Um, and it's in, it's in my Bible. And I want to read this to you. I think it's in Luke. I hope I can find it. If not, we'll just, we'll just skip it. But I scotched, oh, this may be it. This is it. Okay. This is from Ellen White, uh, a book called Counsels to Writers and Editors. You might want to write the reference down and, and check me up on this. Counsels to Writers and Editors, pages 63 through 64. Counsels to write, and understand, I'm not bashing my church. I'm here. <laughs> I'm here. I believe I'm in the right place. But um, we need to be sensitive. Okay. She says this. Counsels to writers and editors, pages 63 and 64. She says this. Those who have had... Oh, uh, among the Catholics, there are many who are most conscientious Christians and who walk in all the light that shines upon them, and God will work in their behalf. Those who have had great privileges and opportunities and who have failed to improve their physical, mental, and moral powers, but who have lived to please themselves and have refused to bear the responsibility, are in greater danger and in greater condemnation before God than those who are in error upon doctrinal points, yet who seek to live to do good to others. It's a powerful statement. Do not censure others. Do not condemn them. If we allow selfish considerations, false reason reasoning, and false excuses to bring us into a perverse state of mind and heart so that we shall not know the ways and will of God, we shall be far more guilty than the open sinner. We need to be very cautious in order that we may not condemn those who before God are less guilty than ourselves. And she's writing this, it's called Counsels to Writers and Editors. She's writing this to just, you know, be wise in the things that you publish in the magazine, in our, in our publications. She says that. Which is scary to me because I have all of this knowledge that I've gained over the years about Scripture and about my duty here on earth. So now I'm more accountable to God. And if I'm living selfishly and if I'm not improving on my mental and moral powers, Ellen White says, I am more guilty and in greater condemnation before God than those who are in error upon doctrinal points. God has his people all over the place. We need to be aware of that. Okay. If you ever find yourself ensnared by this Babylonian system that unites paganism and Christianity, will you heed the warning of God's word to come out of Babylon? I hope so. Me too. All right. This is what we learned today. All that purports to be truth may not be truth. So how do you know what truth is? The Bible. What did Jesus say? Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word, thy word is truth. John 17, 17. There was an apostasy in the days of historical Babylon, and spiritual Babylon represents a major, major apostasy today. In religious spiritual matters, the majority is always wrong, usually wrong, and these types of, on planet Earth they are, right? Okay, so we'll stop there. Any questions? Comments? No? Okay, who needs lesson, the next lesson? Where is the next lesson? Okay, we'll get you the lessons. <laughs> I left them back there. Okay, let's all stand and let's have a word of prayer. And our next lesson is Tuesday night, 7 o'clock. Lord Jesus, thank you for this lesson. And Lord, we pray that we will be close to you and respect you and reverence you, worship you. Above all, Lord, love you with all of our hearts. And help us, Lord, to be readers of your word, to know for ourselves what you say, so that we can be better equipped to resist temptation and false teachings 
in ways that are always before us, even in the church, Lord. We understand, Jesus, that the devil can tempt people outside of our, our church in unique ways. And inside our church, Lord, he will alter his tactics and his temptations for those inside the church. We know this to be true. So help us to be alert, help us to be poised, and to be filled with your Holy Spirit always. And help us to love others as you love us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.